Sir Qui-Gon, is that a poncho you're wearing? Why yes, Anakin. Then isn't that considered cultural appropriation to the indigenous Americans? Anakin, I hope one day you meet a little shit like yourself down the line. Then I'll make sure to take great care of him. Nostalgia, a precarious word which provokes various but different memories for each generation. Some consider it when they defeated the Nazis, while others perceive it as a moment where they made it in life standing heads and tails above the rest. But for me, it was when I first witnessed Star Wars The Phantom Menace for the first time and found for one of the few moments in life fun and joy before being sent back to Korea. Young, dumb, and full of cum. Nostalgia talk aside, let's take a look back in time to when the franchise was at its high and celebrate the 25th anniversary of The Phantom Menace. Now, if you've seen my previous videos, I'm a big fan of Ewan McGregor to an extreme degree. You gotta be fucking kidding me. In which I already own two different versions of Obi Wan, so laying my hands on a younger version would have had. Moving beyond my personal fetishes, I have to say Bandai nailed it out of the park again, as this time around they returned to what they majored in real life characters as Kenobi this time around retains all the details as if Ewan McGregor was ripped right out of the cinema and into my hands, as just by looking at the headpiece alone Bandai and the SH Figos line has rendered Kenobi's short Padawan hair with the addition of the golden brown dry brushing, something I haven't seen since their original Han Solo release. This is in addition to the short ponytail that clearly signifies that Jedi Padawans have longer hair than Korean recruits. Alongside the pattern 1 brace that clearly signifies Obi-Wan is a Jedi in training, or in modern depressing turns, still an intent. But maybe the most important part of the head is the young McGregor face, which is beautifully replicated. I sound like a broken tape. This is supported by the thick eyebrows that ups Kenobi's wrist and shows that he is a manly man. Not to forget about the large, manly, Caucasian nose that makes it a nose that both kaijus and anime characters could only dream of. The thick and square jawline that was invisible with the beard for future iterations that makes me regret my dietary choices, and the highly defined lips that is a far departure from the more or less rudimentary mouth from anime characters, and makes me admire the IRL human structure. But if you find the out of the box face lackluster, there is this distressed face in which unlike the typical one, possesses focused eyebrows alongside a wrinkled forehead, the eyes retain a more puppy eye look, the mouth seems to have more pressure applied, again the puppy look, the slightly open mouth, and a divided chin, which is perfect in portraying Obi-Wan when he's either worried for his master's safety or isn't ready for child support. But do you know the similarity between Obi-Wan and Ghidorah? It's that they both possess a long neck. Mamma mia! Moving down to the torso, Kenobi, or more or less the Jedi of the Republic, retained a similar tunic-like robe, but such outfit aids in highlighting Obi-Wan's broad shoulders, but at the cost of concealing most of his chest, probably for convenience sake. This is not mentioning the arms that unlike the future designs down the line, possess the large sleeves allowing for extra comfort. Look at the belt, it's there for a pure utilitarian standpoint as the brown leather material can hold various accessories from a Jedi signature weapon, this weapon is your life, additional pouches, to extra ammo, making it the jack of all boxes, wait, is that the correct term? And the skirt ends way before the knees, making Freeran a run for her money. When observing Obi-Wan's legs, the boots this time around are highly detailed compared to a certain elf, especially with the dark brown paint job, extra dry brushing on certain parts, and the extra stripes embedded on, making for the perfect boots when- engaging in prolonged combat or reenacting the big G. When looking at what Kenobi is accompanied by, let's just say that while Kenobi is packing, life is good, but it can be better. Besides the additional head, there are your hands that you've definitely seen before. Besides your fists, 
install your open hands for blasting, the right Vegeta has that Kenobi would employ later down the line, a left alternative open hand to touch miners, and holding hands to wield Kenobi's lightsaber. Talk about lightsaber! There's Kenobi's initial blue bladed lightsaber, the signature weapon of the Jedi, in which lacks the signature hilt that Kenobi would later adopt and instead possess a more simple, Apple-esque design with a hardly open handle and instead 80% of it is covered in a certain hilt metal. This is not mentioning the blue blade that this time around is more short and thick, attributed to the blade design seen throughout the prequel trilogy, all of which portrays Obi-Wan's status as a Jedi Padawan and can beat the asses of droids or sword-wielding foes alike. But if you want Obi-Wan in his peacekeeping negotiator mode, there is this unignited lightsaber in which, with the bulging out pet, can be inserted into the hole in the waist. Wait, that sounded wrong. Can be placed on the belt. But once Kenobi is slowly on the edge and his lightsaber thrown down the well, Kenobi is left with no other choice than to wield his fallen master's lightsaber, in which Obi-Wan is accompanied by his master, Qui-Gon Jinn's lightsaber that's this time around, the hilt lacks the metallic cover and instead the black patterns that Kenobi would later adopt are there, and retains a green blade and will be the weapon to make Maul half the man he was. When looking at how Kenobi stands, this is Kenobi when he was relatively young so he doesn't reach the heights of either his master or his apprentice down the line. But don't be fooled as Kenobi as being a Caucasian male in his 20s still has the biological advantage, especially over anime characters, as he stands at 15.5 centimeters or 6.1 inches tall. Here's Kenobi next to Gunpla, Kaijus, all virgins on screen, and the Duel of the Fates set. As an SH figure's posability is a factor that, that is a key component when defining the particular line, which contributes to the figure's release in this line possessing a high range of articulation. In doing so, Obi-Wan here retains a wide range of posability over either your saints or elves. The head, as being connected by a ball joint, can allow for a wide side-to-side -side movement, but due to the Giga Chad chin, up and down movement is limited, shoulder lift is fair but limited due to the Jedi robe, there is your bicep movement, elbows can bend roughly 90 degrees, typical hand movement, and similar to the head, while side to side movement is superb, up and down movement is limited due to the flexible nature of the scud, like split 4 in the IRL character is superb, knees can bend over 90 degrees, a stiff feet movement, and a toe bend. But if you're tired of your typical Jedi or bounty hunter and want a prequel exclusive character, there is no one other than Obi-Wan's wise old, not free and old, not master and the father figure Anakin needed, Qui-Gon Jinn. Now, as the first non-premium Bandai iteration of Master Qui-Gon, I was filled with excitement and come and behold, wait, something's not right. Now, as a movie junkie I am, I am quite versed in Liam Neeson's facial structure. But looking here, Bandai seems to have had a few screws loose, as Liam Neeson's image isn't properly portrayed as the forehead is a little too large, the eyes are too large with the black eyeliner going a little too long, and the poorly depicted beard. But what Bandai did get right is the hair which, with the brown long hair and two separate points coming out in front, perfectly depicts the Jesus hair. This is in addition to the large ears that Liam Neeson possesses, allowing for Qui-Gon Jinn to have enhanced hearing and rival Freerun in such regards. Now, if you want extra taste regarding facial expressions, there is this additional open mouth face that by removing the original and plucking it in, you have Qui-Gon Jinn with a shocked expression as portrayed through, more wrinkles on the forehead, narrow eyebrows, the puppy eyes, the extra thickness in the cheeks, and a dead open mouth, which combines to an expression as if he saw the failure of his apprentice, or unironically when he's in peak. Come! Moving down to the body, Qui-Gon, just like Obi-Wan, wears the standard monk-like Jedi robes, but as Qui-Gon being played by a 193cm Scottish man, he wears a bigger sized robe compared to Obi-Wan. 
this is not mentioned a slightly darker sand tone paint job, which perfectly portrays Qui-Gon's disdain for the dogmatic ways of the Jedi instead chooses his own path. Like a rebel. The belt also retains a similar attributes to that of Kenobi's as the thin brown belt is there while being equipped not with the run-of-the-mill bullets, but instead those made out of chrome, alongside a couple of mud brown pockets, contrary to Kenobi's darker brown. Look at the skirt, it also differentiates itself from Obi-Wan's through the length as unlike Kenobi whose skirt reaches his thighs, Qui-Gon's skirt reaches his knees on both sides. Do you think maybe he's compensating? for something. <laughs> this is not the only point of difference as Master Qui-Gon wears some mud brown pants embedded with various wrinkles, alongside a pair of unique looking boots that with the multiple stripe patterns makes for some cool drip. When observing what Qui-Gon is accompanied by, just like Kenobi comes to an equivalent level of accessories. When discussing the accompanying hands, besides your out-of-the-box fists for fisting, there are your open hands to use the force, semi-open hands to risk people up, a holding right hand to wield the Jedi Master's communication device, a wide palm to hold the hologram device, crossed holding hands and ordinary holding hands to wield Qui-Gon Jinn's lightsaber. And talking about Qui-Gon Jinn's lightsaber, it's more or less identical to the one accompanied by Obi-Wan and makes for some cool poses that portray Master Jinn's wise and humble Jedi ways. The only difference I can find is that the blade is less translucent and composed of a less glossy green plastic. Plastic, alongside the blade being able to be removed unlike the one accompanied by Obi-Wan. Talking about removable blades, there is this alternative moving blade that has been accompanied with recent Star Wars figure arts that can be inserted into the handle and aid in recreating Qui-Gon Jinn in action poses. But if you want Qui-Gon Jinn in his aggressive negotiations mode, there is the non-ignited handle with a small pad that you can shove up the hole on the bell. Then there's this miniature comps device that while the sculpt is decent, the paint job is more or less rudimentary and when placed on the signature holding hand, can recreate when Master Qui-Gon Jinn is calling Obi-Wan. Then there is this hologram device with Naboo Star Skiff hologram that can be removed mid-accessory. But just like the Jedi uniform are these additional Jedi robes that have been accompanied with the previous iteration of Obi-Wan. And by placing the robes on Qui-Gon Jinn, you have Master Jinn in his wise old Jedi ways that strives towards offering the best for all beings throughout the galaxy, from younger men to little boys. Why are you gay? And I have to admit that just like Mando, the fabric here is of high quality and inserted with some flexible bendy wire. But a drawback regarding the robe is that due to the bendy wire, the hoodie and robe fail to organically blend onto the respective characters, like on the big screen. But if you want top tier cultural appropriation, there is this Navajo style poncho that you place by removing the head and inserting the arms. And the poncho surely does add to Qui-Gon's drip and is a unique point regarding Qui-Gon's wardrobe, as it is hard to see other Jedi's adopt this poncho. And the poncho, just like the robe, is composed of high quality fabric, but unlike the robe that was inserted with a bendy wire, the poncho lacks any of these gimmicks and composed of only pure fabric and knitting, resulting in an outfit that organically blends onto the figure. As explained before, Qui-Gon Jinn being played by a 193cm Scottish man, Bandai has succeeded in replicating Qui-Gon Jinn's actual height into figure form as he stands at roughly 16cm or 6.3 inches tall, making him stand at the taller range of humanoid characters. Here's Qui-Gon Jinn next to Gumpla, Kaijus, fellow virgins, and his pattern one Obi-Wan and soon to be killer, Darth Maul. Regarding Qui-Gon's posability, having a more or less identical body sculpt to his Padawan, there isn't really any difference regarding articulation. Qui-Gon Jinn as having a less pronounced jawline than Obi-Wan, up and down movement is better, side to side movement is still good, but regarding the rest, they're more or less identical. Body movement, shoulder lift, elbow bend, hand movement, leg spread, knee bend, less stiff feet movement, and a toe bend. 
So, regarding my thoughts on the two Jedi's, Padawan Obi-Wan Kenobi and Master Qui-Gon Jinn are two amazing figures in which retain an immaculate sculpt alongside being accompanied by a very assortment of accessories. This is not mentioning the pretty impressive range of articulation. The only gripe I have is that Bandai failed to accurately replicate Liam Neeson's likeness regarding the face sculpt, resulting in a Jedi Master that doesn't look like he's into kids, but into kids. But even with such faults, they are great figures and if you can, I would highly recommend both these Jedis. In doing so, I'm gonna give the Jedi Padawan Obi-Wan Kenobi a ranking of an A+, and Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn a ranking of an A-.